Fawcett Professor of Education and Public Policy here at the Lynch School. And it's my pleasure to invite you to come to the 20th Annual Fawcett Lecture, which is made possible by the generosity of Jeff and Amy Fawcett, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. Our speaker this afternoon is Beatrice Pont, a prolific and distinguished contributor to the study of international education policy. Beatrice did her undergraduate work at Pitzer College in Fremont, California, and her graduate work at Columbia University. Following stints with the Economic and Social Council of the Spanish Government, with the consulting firm Accenture, and with the Institute of Social, Gov uh, Institute of Social Sciences at Tokyo University, in 1990 she joined the Directorate for Education and Skills at the OECD in Paris. She is currently affiliated with the Laboratory for Interdisciplinary Evaluation of Public Policies at Sciences Po in Paris while on leave from the OECD to complete a long-delayed dissertation. During her tenure at OECD, Beatrice has consulted with education ministries all over the world, including Mexico, Colombia, Wales, Norway, and Sweden. Her work has dealt with a broad range of issues such as school leadership, adult learning skills, and the topic for this afternoon, equity and quality in education. Now for the public, the OECD's Director for Education and Skills is best known for its sponsorship of international large-scale assessment surveys such as PISA, which targets 15-year-olds, and PIAC, which targets adults from 16 to 65, as well as informational surveys such as TALIS. However, equally important are the interpretive reports that are associated with these surveys and the various series of reports on the condition of education in, in the countries that comprise the OECD. Beatrice has led two such key series for the OECD, the Country Reviews Program and the Education Policy Outlook. The former provides in-depth analyses of countries' education programs and results, while the latter provides a comparative analysis of education reforms across the OECD. These comparative analyses are of great interest, as most countries today are striving to improve educational outcomes overall and especially for those groups that have traditionally lagged behind in achievement and attainment. Indeed, as a unique resource, both series are eagerly awaited by stakeholders and policymakers across the OECD and beyond. As I noted earlier, the twin goals of equity and quality have been integral to much of Beatrice's policy work and are the focus of her talk today. In particular, drawing on an extensive database of, of reforms undertaken by the 34 OECD countries over the past seven years, Beatrice and her colleagues have been able to distill some valuable lessons on the strategies that can help countries make substantial and sustainable progress. But at the same time, they are appropriately cautious on what one country can borrow or adapt from another because of differences in political context, in educational governance, as well as in culture and tradition. Here in the United States, we are slowly accepting the reality of our mediocre standing among OECD countries with regard to both equity and quality. We are also being bombarded by prescriptions of what we must do to become more competitive. Many of these prescriptions are long on bombast, but short on nuance, and are delivered with a certainty that belies the complex challenges in developing constructive education policies. We are indeed fortunate to have Beatrice at our speaker today. She draws on a wealth of experience in cross-national policy studies, a deep understanding of the myriad factors that shape trajectories of education reform, as well as the messy realities of policy formulation and adoption. She brings a balanced perspective, not only on what change strategies countries might consider, but also how they can address the most likely obstacles to successful implementation. And with that, I ask you to join me in warmly welcoming Beatrice Bonner to DC. really a wonderful pleasure for me to be here today and I really thank the Boise, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Boise for inviting me and Henry for, for having me here, for asking me to the Dean and also I think to Dennis and to Andy Harvest who I've been working with in the last few years doing education policy reviews across OECD countries. So for me it's quite a, a, a big, big pleasure to be at DC to get to know you more in depth because I've looked at your university from afar and now to be part of it for a day is really a big pleasure. 
So I'm going today to speak to you about education change in a comparative perspective <coughs> of the limited of the 34 or 33 OECD countries. Uh, 33 because Switzerland did not participate in our study because education is so decentralized. They don't have a national policy making framework. But uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about is look at all the education policy reforms that OECD countries have done in the last seven years to try to understand what are the change strategies that are um, coming through. Do they have clear change strategies? Are they applying a common sense and a, a political science perspective into policy making, or is it more random? So we're going to look at that. And uh, <coughs> the main sources is the OECD work that I've been doing and the knowledge that I've been acquiring through this. And the main findings, I'm going to give them to you now and show them to you later. It is that uh, countries indeed focus in the key policy areas that most experts say make a difference in improving the results of our students and our education systems. That, uh, but actually, you're going to see that the volume, the sheer volume and speed of reforms is a bit overwhelming, as I will show you. And that there is a lack of clarity in change strategies across OECD countries. So let us begin. I'm going to start with an overview of uh, change and reforms in education. And then I will look at the policies for equity and quality in education, and then respond or try to respond with you, actually, the question, is there a gap between the policies, the expectations, and what really needs to be happening in the classroom for meaningful change? So from policy to practice, what actually could happen and what actually does happen. So let us start. Countries across the OECD have really been um, introducing reforms in quite a, a, a large scale in the last um, seven years. And this is based on a, a, a survey that I did with my team of what types of reforms have countries undertaken between 2008 and 2014 um, across the education system. And what we saw is that, or what we gathered, the information we gathered, more than 450 reforms in the last seven years. Now that's really overwhelming. More than 450 of all kinds of reforms only in education policy. I think that you can say that that is excessive. <laughs> I would say it's excessive, but you will see also how, how what it looks like. Now, why are they invested? Well, we know that at least one in five uh, young children uh, at age 15 do not reach a minimum level that is satisfactory to function in today's society, and that is according to PISA. So you see there the US, you have about 25%, um, but uh, the OECD average is about 20. And we see actually that some countries have indeed improved because there the, the the Romus is the countries where this proportion has diminished, and that is Italy, Portugal, Poland, Germany, but also Mexico, Turkey, and Japan. These countries actually have managed to reduce the proportion of low performers. The US has stayed stable since 2000, 2003. Uh, why? Not only PISA at the OECD. Uh, when I was working at the OECD, we don't only use PISA, but other indicators as well, to try to be balanced. And actually, we know that there is a share of those who drop out or who do not finish K-12, which is still remains quite important. In the US, 90% finish, but there's a 10% that don't finish. And that hasn't changed, actually. And you will see instead Korea, where they've made a huge, huge improvement in completion and in actually in skills level. And um, I think we used to say that Korea used to have the same level as Afghanistan more than 40 years ago, and they devoted themselves to a human capital development strategy that has worked. You also see, we can also see Ireland, where it has also increased quite a lot, which is right there in the middle, and, so not, and the US, where it hasn't changed in the last, um, in the last 10 to 20 years. So, um, and again, we also see that almost one in five are idle, idle youth, as we would say. They're not employed or they are inactive. 
and, uh, and that is still a high proportion of, of people who remain without work or, or um, inactive and not in education. So that, that is also quite an important issue for many countries, especially for European Union countries. And finally, also, why, why do countries invest in education policy? Well, as we know, and this is one of the one a big issue for the US, is that the impact of the socioeconomic background of students remains very, very important in the results of it, in the education results. So who you are matters very much to your education results. And you see here actually that uh, it's not the migrant background that matters, but it's actually being in the bottom quarter of the socioeconomic uh, background that matters. So whether you, your people are poor or have uh, not a lot of, um, ed not well-educated parents makes a big, big difference. And that happens across many countries, so that is the, the red point here. This is the risk of being a low performer in PISA according to your socioeconomic background, and it's at least two points higher than overall across the OECD. And for migrants, depending on the countries, it may be higher. So for example, in, this is uh, Norway, I think, is quite high, or uh, Finland as well. So in Nordic countries where there is high political migration and refugee migration, the levels are very different. So education systems have to tackle these issues and they're designing policies in order to respond. And at the same time, it is not the resources that are invested, but how they are invested that matters. And equity, here's where I come to the equity point, which is very, very important and has come up as a big priority across education systems. So when there is more equity in resource allocation, there is more quality in education. And you see here in the, oops, in the US, um, that is right in the middle. So there's not a very, high, very equitable funding structure across the US. Now why also do countries invest more and more? Because it's um, reducing school failure pays off. Um, school failure is expensive. It costs our welfare systems quite a lot because you have to pay higher public health expenditures, higher welfare expenditures, higher criminality, and at the same time you have lower lower tax income into the into the national government. So actually, it is very expensive to have dropout and to have school failure, and that is quite a convincing point for policymakers to want to invest in education for quality and for equity. And that is one of the points of how to convince both right-wing and left-wing parties that equity matters. Because economically, it's a reasonable um, premise to hold that you have to invest in both if you want growth. And at the same time, more and more economists and more and more sociologists know that equity makes a very large difference in growth. I don't know if you've heard of Thomas Piketty, who just published the, the capital, and he's shown how wealth inequalities are so much linked with the need to invest in equity in education. And this has also been demonstrated by Sinano recently that uh, income inequality has an impact on future inequality, on equal growth, and that there is a need to invest, especially in the more disadvantaged. So, out of all of this, what we also know is that it can be done. Education systems have managed to invest in both equity and quality. And uh, this figure, which is my favorite figure, I'm going to show you, I don't know if, if you know this figure. It shows the PISA scores according to both equity and quality. And what you can see in the green here, in the green quadrant, are the countries where, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to score highly in that country, more or less. The impact of the background, of your background on education is low, and you're scoring high. So, and that brings a number of high performers, which are Korea, Japan, Switzerland, Finland, Australia, Canada, Estonia, a little bit the UK is right there on the verge, and here is the US, as, as Henry was saying, on the average, and staying there. And that's not where the US should be. The 
should be up there. And that's where the big aims, I think, of much of your policy has been trying to push the US to be a higher performer and aiming as well uh, to deliver more equity. On the other side, we see countries with a more German model where they track students at early ages. And so who the students are makes a very large difference on the results. And you, so you see the Czech Republic, you see Germany, you see Poland, so more um, Eastern Europe and, and uh, German countries that are having. And on the other side, you see, well, Mexico, no, and Sweden, which I will tell you the Swedish story later on. Quite a low performer when you see there. Um, US close to Spain, my own country, and also Denmark, not far, Greece, Turkey, and Portugal. So this is the story, this is where education systems want to aspire to be, combining equity with quality. And we know it can be done because education systems have managed to do it. And actually, how can this be done? Well, a lot of researchers have been investing and in more recent years, what are the policy levers that make a difference to improve school outcomes for equity and quality? Well, you can invest in equity quality, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Also in preparing students for the future, in school improvement, and that includes, of course, teachers. And this is the core of what you do at the Lynch School. Prepare teachers well to deliver the best education possible for your students. Invest in school leaders, curriculum, evaluation and assessment, all of this surrounded by sound policy and sound governance and appropriate funding. And all of this needs to be with a high degree of consistency, which is what you're not finding in across countries. Now, for, I'm going to focus on equity and quality for a little bit. What are the policies that um, can contribute to improve equity with quality, to have more equitable education systems. We know that investing early on makes the largest differences in uh, the results of our children later on, and also eliminate system level policies that hinder equity and invest and support disadvantaged schools. And what does that mean? Well, the first one, to eliminate system level policies that hinder equity. One of them is to invest in early childhood education and care, and many countries have been doing that as a big priority in the last five to 10 years. To postpone early tracking, and that's basically many of the German models that I would say, and they have been investing in reducing early tracking. To have equivalency in upper secondary education so that vocational education and training and more academic pathways are similar in value and not a second option for the low performers. And the next one is to manage school choice and uh, so that it avoids inequality. School choice strengthens segregation and doesn't improve the results of, um, of education systems overall. But when you design policies that counterbalance the negative impact of school choice, they can strengthen results. And finally, to make funding more responsive to needs. So those are the system level policies. And at the school level, we know that countries are investing and that what works is very related to what's the core business of schools. And that is to support it, to have supportive school climates where there are good relationships between teachers and students, teachers and teachers, teachers and the principal. And that is a priority in disadvantaged schools where very importantly, they have to have high expectations for their children, and that often does not happen. Disadvantaged schools just want to get their kids out with a certificate, but don't have high expectations. And the most high-performing school systems invest and decide and, and make it very transparent that they have high expectations for everybody. And students actually deliver. And they um, support positive school climates. Also, for disadvantaged schools, it's important to have quality professionals, quality to invest in having the best teachers in the most challenging schools and the best principals in the most challenging schools. And that is what the high performers do. That's what Japan does, that's what Korea does, and that is how they get 
very good results with their disadvantaged schools. They have to have the right skills to be able to deliver effective classroom strategies that respond to the needs of more disadvantaged students and to have strong parental and um, community engagement. And that is very important, even more important in disadvantaged schools than in regular schools, to have the strong link with the parents to be able to convince them of the value of education, to make sure that between the school and the family, they're following the students all along their trajectories in education. And so what actually happens in reality? So this is the more theoretical framework, but what happens in reality? How are countries, what types of policies are they investing in? Well, this is out of the 450 policies that I was telling you about before, the biggest priority is actually preparing students for the future. Almost 29% of the policies across the 34 countries invest in preparing students for the future. That means uh, vocational education and training, tertiary education and transitions into work and policies to prevent dropouts. But the second, and the second is actually school improvement. And one of the big components of this is teacher policy, school leadership policy, and curriculum. And the third is equity and quality in education. With some investment also in government, in governance and policies for governance and designing grand visions and funding. And what does this mean? Well, for equity, as I was saying, there's a number of countries that have been investing very clearly on equity, and uh, they spend about 9% about of the total amount of policies have been focused on supporting disadvantaged students and schools. And what we see is that the countries that do this are the countries that do have clear challenges in disadvantaged students. And that is, for example, New Zealand, which has a big Maori population and minority population, or Australia. Uh, in Germany, where they had a lot of immigrants, they also have a national action plan for migration, so they design. In uh, Finland, they've created even a special curriculum for immigrants. In the UK, they have a pupil premium for disadvantaged students who want to drop out. So they were giving them money actually to stay in school. Uh, in Austria, they did a new middle school reform to try to support also um, the separation of low socioeconomic background students and to prevent early trapping. And uh, in Chile, where there's a lot of school choice and there wasn't a lot of support for disadvantaged schools, they created a law of preferential subsidies, making disadvantaged students more uh, attractive to, to any kind of school. So it's a subsidy that where money follows the student and it's really changed the way that the system is working and that students get accepted. So about 9% of the universe of policies is focused on disadvantaged students. And then we see the, the bigger amount of policies have been invested in teachers. Because we know, and I think more and more policymakers know that in order to make change <coughs> effective, educational change happen, you have to invest in the teaching profession. Now this figure shows you the percentage of lower secondary teachers who believe that teaching is a, a valued profession in society. This is from Talis, and we see that in the US, only about 30% of the teachers do feel that this is a valued profession in society. And we see that in the most high-performing countries, such as Korea, Finland, or Alberta, for, for Canada, as a proxy for Canada, we also have Mexico there, but that very high performing countries do have, um, they're the ones that are high performing and do have a, a very high statute, statute uh, profession. And, but what we also see is that many, many countries are investing in teacher policy. And they're in all, <coughs> across all the range of, of, uh, of teacher quality. So you see that Finland, uh, because they still, their PISA results are still are going down, actually, even though they're quite a high performer, they're investing in developing a teacher training program. In Korea, they've developed a new evaluate, teacher evaluation system. 
in Mexico a full constitutional reform to develop a more professional teaching body. In the Netherlands, they had the teachers program. In Australia, they've done a number of teacher policy policies, including the development of the, of, of the Institute for Teacher and School Leadership. So you see in the US, the Teach Quality Partnership Program. In France, Italy, or Sweden, they've all reformed their teacher, initial teacher training program. So a lot of countries are investing in trying to change and reform and modernize initial teacher education. But they're also doing teacher standards or teacher certification, such as the case of New Zealand. And this amounts to almost 14% 40, of the policies um, of the total reforms that have been implemented in the last seven years. And what do we see as well? There's been a lot of reforms, and these are all related to equity, because equity is not only for disadvantaged students, but what you, how you develop teachers, how you invest in teachers, and how you invest in curriculum, and the types of national strategies that you do um, for supporting schools to improve. And we see that a number of countries have been also doing curricular reforms. Um, Japan changed, the, implemented the course of study. Finland is now in the process of having a whole curricular reform. Italy as well. Sweden has a new curriculum. The U in the UK, Scotland has implemented the curriculum for excellence. So you see what a map of reforms. And every time I look at this, I actually get overwhelmed in trying to make sense out of this universe of, of policies. And it does not stop. Australia implemented a new strategy, student first. Wales, a school improvement plan that recently evolved into something else. In Northern Ireland, every good school, a good school. In Ireland, a national strategy for literacy and numeracy. So you see, and in New Zealand, a student achievement function. So we see, again, for school leadership, so we've seen teachers, school improvement and curricular strategies, and now school leadership strategies, which only amount to less than 3% of the total uh, reforms, even though they make sense, even though it is also after teachers, the second most important lever to invest in if you want to have good student outcomes. But when you look at the, the investment, it's not that high. And we see that only nine countries have really invested, and it's been Mexico who, before, when you select, uh, in order to become a principal, you had to be a member of the teacher union rather than having the right skills. And so now they're trying to move towards a more <coughs> professional service. Or in Finland, where they created an advisory board for personnel, or in Portugal, they developed uh, a mandatory training for school leaders. So in many countries, there was no training for school leaders. So it's rather teachers who had five years of practice and who now became principals because they had been there for a number of years. So a number of countries are reforming and developing more concrete um, um, school leader programs. So. Out of all of this, we see in more in detail that uh, the teacher policy has been the most uh, commonly adopted, following then investment in disadvantaged students, actually. So this is the good news. The good news is that investments of reforms are on the right policy areas that you would want for equity and for quality. Uh, they're investing in curriculum as well, um, learning environments, also um, in uh, tertiary and vocational education and training, and in assessment as well. But the good news, as I was saying, are these. Teacher policy is one of the priorities, as is equity. Now, conversely, we're going to see, well, out of all of these policies, how do you make sense out of them? So we looked at uh, what are, are countries actually following any coherent change strategies? And that is one of the questions when looking at this such a large universe of policies. So we looked at the fourth way from um, Dennis Shirley and Andy Hargraves. What are they proposing? And different experts on who are proposing change strategies. Is that actually happening in practice? Well, we know also that Hattie talks about the politics of distraction. And uh, that there's been a lot of 
policy borrowing. A lot of literature on the art or science of policy borrowing. Countries looking to each other, and this is what at the OECD I think it's a good place to broker knowledge on this, but does that actually work? So what we see is that there's been, this is the PISA change. Since 2000 or 2003, countries whose results have improved or decreased, these are the countries where results have improved. So it's Israel, Turkey, Mexico, Portugal, Italy, Poland. And that's the level of, the, these are significant. These are non-significant changes. And that's where the US, you can find the US. And these are countries where results have fallen in the last 10 years, according to PISA. The last one is Sweden, followed by Finland, Czech Republic, New Zealand, or Australia. So uh, we try to see if there's any type of form difference <coughs> in the types of reforms they were adopting, depending on their, you know, their, their education system and the results they were getting. So we see that all countries are adopting reforms, no matter where they are in the, in the PISA uh, progress, you could say the PISA progress scale. And um, we see that there is a certain coherence in the way they're investing. And so here's the green bar are uh, equity and quality and preparing students for the future. The orange yellow is um, school improvement and assessment, and the blue is governance and funding. So you can see here that most where countries compare in the way they invest in their policies, it's a bit small to see. And I'll show you the US, which is the only one that's very different. And that is because you have policy to funding. And so at a national level, because it's uh, decentralized. So most of the policies in blue are funding policies to the states in order to deliver um, their plans. And so what comes out of this is that uh, we see that uh, the reforms that countries are implementing, they're very context-based. Uh, they're influenced by the structure of the system, by the policy agenda, by the very concrete challenges that they have. And so you cannot really find common answers because they're targeting for example, the Maori situation, or in Canada, the Inuit, or the Indian population, or in Spain, or um, the Roma population. So they're really responding to the very concrete challenges. At the same time, they have very political and historical <coughs> developments, and um, some systems are centralized, others are decentralized, with schools having a lot of responsibility, with local governments having a lot of responsibility. So really, there is, um, it's very varied, the context is very varied, so the policies have to respond to the context. We also see that the types of policies that are being implemented are very, very diverse. In terms of the duration, in terms of the types of policies, some countries have laws, other countries have action plans, other countries have strategies, other have every two year changes in the way they follow, and, and there's a certain degree of overlap in the policies as well. We see that school improvement policies overlap with the disadvantaged policies. And so there is a sea, you know, a shower of policies that um, is being, is abiding to the schools and uh, that are difficult to handle. And finally, we see something very important. We see that only 10% of the 450 policies have actually um, done or are doing evaluation of the impact of their policies. So that is very little. A lot of investment and nobody knows what for <laughs> because we don't know the results. So at the end when you ask me, well, so who's the one who's doing it right? We don't know <laughs> because there's not a lot of evaluation going on by the policy making, so rather by the research world, but not by the policy making world at all. So I'm going to show you a little bit the universe of reforms in a more concrete way. I've given you the comparative approach, but now I'm going to show you some countries and to see what they've been doing. So here's the example of Australia. Australia had elections in 2007, 2010, 2013, and these are all the reforms they've implemented in the last 10 years. So um, you can't see the words, but I, I could make it. <laughs> 
big enough for you to see, and that's actually the point. In 2008, um, the way that Australia does policy is through national partnerships with the states, because it's a decentralized country where policies are, 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 are taken up by the states. But um, the national government has also funding, I think like the US very much, and so they have the Smarter School <coughs> National Partnership for Low Socioeconomic Status Communities, Closing the Gap for Indigenous Early Childhood Education, a National Assessment Program in Literacy and Numeracy, National Partnership Agreements for Smarter Schools, this only in 2008. In 2009, a National Partnership for Youth Attainment and Transitions, a National Targets for Higher Education, um, a National Education Agreement, Investing in Early Years. In 2010, they, create, they developed a National Professional Standards for Teachers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Student um, Nash Action Plan, so uh, my school website. So you see, I mean, this is just an example. And Australia is a high performer with equity and quality. And to my perspective, they have great policies, actually. When they do them, they're great. They're very, they created the National Institute, the ICLE, the National Institute for, for Teaching and School Leadership, which is a great institution, and they've been developing standards for teachers, um, better teacher training programs, and for principals as well. So they've really been investing in developing uh, teachers. When you put all of this together, you see that their core has been um, early childhood education and care, teachers and school leaders, equity and assessment and skills. But where is the consistency? There's a changing vision, there's a constant um, change or shower of reform. So if you are at the school, you're a principal or you're a local policymaker, what do you do every year when you have to plan, when you have to, when you have to develop the next step? And so you're still doing great, but I think that uh, th this speaks for itself. Now I'm going to show you also Ireland. Ireland is a country where they've invested, they're stable in their performance, but they're doing quite well. And there, you see there the time when they implemented the reforms. So they've been a bit more moderate than Australia, and they've implemented um, a lot of policies in school improvement and in vocational education and training and transitions. So they, they, their main policy was uh, delivering equality of opportunity in schools, which actually is one of the few policies that demonstrated impact in completion and uh, in reducing uh, dropout rates. And so that policy actually has embedded the whole system and it's part of their daily operation now. But at the same time, you see um, intercultural education strategy, a springboard program that's vet professional development for teachers and school leaders. Um, so a national strategy for to improve literacy and numeracy, which is sustained 2011-2020. So I, I think Ireland is a country that is more stable in its policies and stays the course and is not changing. And it probably has to do with the politics of education in the country. Um, then I'm going to show you the story of Sweden, uh, because I actually um, participated or organized a review of uh, Sweden, who is, had the worst fall in PISA results um, across all of OECD countries. And what happened was that um, in the 90s, they decentralized completely education to the 219 municipalities, um, they, they gave school autonomy on wages to schools, and uh, they set up free independent schools, a little bit like the charter movement in the US, but also with the capacity for profit making as well. Uh, they also allowed for free school choice and uh, had a curricular reform and uh, developed afterwards a school inspectorate. And after all of these reforms in the 90s, the results of Sweden have been falling and falling and falling. And actually it's one of the countries where the teaching profession is most eroded and feels worst about their teaching 
job or being a teacher. So they had an election in 2010, and in 2011, they defined a new teacher education reform, national tests for grades six, I think it's five, six, three, six, and nine. They also introduced an upper secondary education reform, a new grading scale for teachers, a curriculum reform, uh, support for minority language students, training schools, and so they introduced all of these reforms all at once, but all of them without any consistency or coherence. They just kept throwing out these reforms into the public to see if the 290 municipalities would take them up and they would just appear into, transform into better student outcomes. So ever since we did a review <coughs> and went in and tried to define a more coherent strategy with a vision. And we don't know where they are now, and only, I think, in five years' time, we will know what happened with Sweden. And we look at uh, Germany, who has been, I think, uh, if Dennis can also <laughs> step in if you would like after, about Germany, but they've had uh, a, um, reforms that have been more focused. They did, in 2003, um, the education standards for fourth, ninth, and tenth grade. And uh, at the same time, they've introduced a lot of reforms for improving the quality of teaching in the teaching profession. Also in initial teacher education. And uh, so they introduced a content requirement for pedagogy in 2008, a quality pack for teachers in 2010, a quality offensive for teachers in 2013, a mobility uh, possibility for mobility for teachers across the different lander, uh, new standards for teachers in 2009. So they've really focused on teachers uh, from a national level and also try to steer the system because it's also a very decentralized system by creating uh, a comprehensive strategy for monitoring. So they created standards and they did monitoring, but with low stakes type of approach. And we can also look at Korean reform. So I, we, I have many stories of reforms. I don't know if I, if, um, how much you want to hear them. I think this will be the last one, where Korea has invested a lot in early childhood education and care. And uh, they've invested in after-school policies for disadvantaged students. And they've also invested, invested in, especially in developing a teacher evaluation framework. So it's been quite focused and quite uh, looking forward. And one of the things that they've invested in, which is something that other countries could learn from, is actually test-free semesters. Because in Korea, they are so tested that I think that one of the issues that they wanted to alleviate the students and the schools, and they created a, a pilot test-free semesters to reduce student stress. So this is something that is very context-based, and it's very focused on, on what or the problems and challenges of Korea. So overall, what do we see out of all of these change strategies? Well, we see on one hand that countries are either opting for equity or for school improvement, that they are, um, whether they invest in equity, if they invest in equity, they don't invest so much in school improvement. And they're also investing in preparing students for the future that teacher policy is really the <coughs> highest point in the agenda, especially in Anglo-Saxon and Nordic countries, but also in Chile, Greece, Germany, Mexico. And you see actually um, that there was a correlation between PISA change and investment in teacher policy, and it was the only correlation that could be found. Um, that also there's been a lot of investment in curriculum reform for preparing students for the 21st century, especially in Asian countries and in Nordic countries as well. And uh, there is a, a correlation between curriculum reform and uh, school leadership and assessment. And also we see that they're not investing enough in school leadership. So what about the national visions? Uh, do countries have a national vision? What after looking at all these showers of reforms, we see that there is not very much clarity across countries in the vision that they can, they define policies after policy after policy and whether there's some coherence to them there's no 
clearly spelled out vision in many countries. Uh, it's not clearly stated. Some of the countries clearly stated in the curriculum sometimes, but others, but there's no clarity as to, and some countries do have unstated strategies that are longer terms, I would say, like Germany or like Ireland. But it's not a very common pattern to have a long-term vision and to steer the system towards that as, as one of the countries or education systems that have high performance that's been used, such as Ontario, where they had a very clear and long-term vision and it was sustained. And finally, only 10% report evaluation for input. So what this, how, do, how do I see this? Well, countries are striving to improve. They're really recognizing the importance and the value of education reforms across all OECD countries. They're investing in the core areas of equity and quality and teachers and uh, school improvement. But reforms have become more political, more visible, more uh, voluminous, more uh, often, more numerous, more everything. Um, there's a lot of policy borrowing, and there's a lot of implementation challenges. So we never really see what happens after the policy. It's very difficult to know. And because there's no evaluation, it's even more difficult. And one of the key issues is how to engage the stakeholders in the implementation of reforms that we've heard a lot of strife for and teacher union strife for in a number of countries that have been implementing reforms. So it is a challenging world out there. The change strategies versus the reality, the messy reality of policy reforms is a fact. It's not uh, easy. And uh, is there from policy making to the classroom? How far is it? And the way we see is, you know, Policy makers, they arrive every four to five, three to four to five years. They have a very clear vision of where they want to go. They have ambitious objectives and multiple objectives and they get to work. But is that matched with the capacity to reach the classrooms? We still, we see that change strategies require more vision, more stability, more clarity, and they require investing in student learning and doing away with all of these policy distractors that shower the system nonstop with new policies and new reforms. And we know that there is a need to focus much, much more on implementation and evaluation to ensure that these reforms reach the classroom. And so out of all of this, I ask myself, is education policy an art or a science? And what have we seen after this shower of reforms is there any systematic analysis, any systematic practices across countries? Is it an art or a science? What would you say? Um, my take on this is that after looking at all the reforms, well, we know that an international overview of all of these policies can give elements, can give principles that countries can look into to use, but there's not one model of success. That, uh, Clear change strategies need to be defined, but context is very important, and each education system needs to look into their own strategies for change, but making sure that they clarify the long-term vision, focus on student learning, which often doesn't happen. They need to do a balanced use of data for improvement, which often doesn't happen because they, the, use, the excessive use of data can also uh, change the way that policy making happens, that we need to invest in leadership and capacity building of teachers and school leaders and policy makers, that the engagement of stakeholders is vital for the success of reforms, and that policies need to be evaluated for process and for impact. And so this is the end of my presentation, and these are the sources that you can download that I did the presentation, and I will now be happy to take any questions or comments that you make. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.
on your analysis, what would be a way to, for a country to think more rationally, that's the appropriate term, in terms of, of that ratio of investment from school leader to teachers, in terms of not just the number of reforms, but actually the amount of money that's, that's spent? Okay. Well, um, the economically, it's much more rational to spend um, policies for school leadership because the impact that they have on a large amount of teachers is very direct. And so, and it is politically easier to invest in school leaders because there's less and uh, they have the capacity as well for change. So it is quite a rational investment. And it hasn't happened until recently, possibly for for a number of reasons. One of them is that it wasn't a profession in many countries until recently, and because leadership for improvement is a concept that has only happened in the last 15 to 20 years, before school leaders are rather, were rather more administrative um, technocrats uh, responding to the needs of ministries or, or very administrative. So countries have not been investing because of lack of awareness until very recent years. We're seeing a change, but that we're seeing a change, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The lack of evaluation seems very surprising. It's a limited evaluation. What? Why is there so little evaluation of policies? Um, because this is the, the balance between politics and policy. Education policy takes a long time, and politicians change every three to four years. So. I think there's no many incentives to evaluate education policy because a politician arrives at the beginning, they find their plan and they leave and they're not fully supported by the results that they get because the results will be later. So when a new government comes in, there's no incentive so much to evaluate the previous one. So there is, this is one of the areas, the reasons why I think there's less evaluation than there should be. It's also very difficult to evaluate a whole reform that is impacting students where there's so many other factors at stake as well. These quite very large policies are very difficult to evaluate as well. It's very challenging. So the lack of sustained attention to the policies is very strongly related to the lack of evaluation. Because the, yeah. they're both driven by the politics. Thank you. Yes, Hans. <laughs> very much for very clear uh, presentation. Uh, would you also not say that uh, it has to do with the fact that politicians much more uh, react on the, the results every time and so look at the high achievers and that is m much more directing their short-term policy than the long-term policy where you have to really invest in the context than looking at what are the high achievers because as you show as well, first everybody looked at Scandinavia in particular to Finland now it is certainly Shanghai and Singapore that are high achievers and they look well, how can we get there? The same like in higher education rankings, everybody looks at the high achievers and that defines much more the policy than a long term. So it is not the, the, the lack of a long term strategy much more important than uh, the fact that they uh, uh, don't do much in evaluation because that's basically resulting in the fact of uh, non evaluation Yes. Um, I will give you the example of Wales, that I also worked with Wales, and the Welsh government also had very low education outcomes, and they were not improving. So they asked the OECD to come in and help them evaluate what they were doing and get recommendations. And when uh, we spoke to the minister, their vision was, well, it, I think this was we did in 2000, it was actually Adam Harper's who was part of the team as well. And um, we asked, what are your objectives? Oh, my objective is that in the next PISA round of 2015, we want to be in the top 20. And that's a two-year objective, and that was it. So you know, we said, well, we need to have a longer-term vision. But now we changed the minister about three months later. <laughs> so, um, we recommended that they have a longer term vision that was not related to PISA, that they use PISA as an indicator for progress if they want, but that they had a Welsh uh, vision of where they needed to be heading towards and what 
meant, what it meant to be Welsh and how that could be translated into the education system and into the longer term strategies for education progress. But um, I, so I think that uh, this lack of vision is also very much linked. Part of it, the PISA, I think, has had a, a strong role of the high performers and we're here and let's everybody do like the hard performers are doing. So there has been, in terms of um, school improvement, a lot of aim to do policy borrowing from Shanghai, from uh, Singapore, from these countries that have a very different context, a very different history, and that uh, I don't know how much their policies can be borrowed and implemented in systems that have not a very similar context or history or political system at all. If there is a national vision that then at the local level can be followed, I think that was, for example, in Sweden, what happened is they decentralized, gave full autonomy to schools and to teachers and to uh, the municipalities to deliver and gave a very, very loose curriculum that uh, teachers could assess at the end of cycles, not even at the end of years, it wasn't clear in the curriculum. So there was such loose control and no clear national vision or no clear evaluation or inspectorate looking really at what was happening at the national level so that uh, it didn't work. And so I think that you can have a decentralized approach if you have a national guiding system and some way to support through autonomy with support and with some type of assessment is what works in the, in the systems that do have a very decentralized approach to education policy. about the teacher preparation programs to hold certain entities accountable and so we can see whether these work or not. So in your does this sort of the way to go or in your analysis, what are the other countries use monitoring evaluation and collect data to really um, sort of drive in improvement? And what are the sort of, what are the countries do in terms of using monitoring? There's different models of uh, evaluation and assessment systems. Some, I think the US is a very interesting example when compared to the rest. So a very clear policy, very clear vision, and challenges in implementation, and I think. But in terms of the policy making process, it's, it's, it's very consistent. Whether you agree or not with the policy itself, that's a different story, but there is a consistency in the whole cycle or process of policy making and evaluation is used strongly, maybe too strongly, in order to, it's very high stakes and there's a lot of, you know, for teachers it's quite an issue what happens with the results. I don't think that there's many more countries using evaluation in such a strong way. I think um, the Netherlands is a very interesting example uh, where there is a very strong school inspectorate and education is completely decentralized. Schools have a lot of freedom. There's a lot of school choice. There's a lot of action at the local level, but there's a lot of data, I think, that's being used and the inspector is using that quite positively and, and giving that data to the system. Australia is also a very interesting example where 
They've been using a lot, a lot of data. They set up a My School website where you can check everything about your school and compare yourself to other schools of the same socioeconomic uh, uh, structure or different or in the region and use that data for improvement. And so I think countries are trying to find which are the best ways to use data that is not a very sanctionary type of approach, but used for improvement. And I think that's where the challenge lies, to find the right balance between prescriptive data or that data that can be used constructively for improvement. Yes. Do you think policy borrowing can be a reason for all this random happening like in the whole global perspective or even a threat for getting to have a pattern or something? Some of the policy borrowing that has been going on has been from Ontario, I think from Asia, from Shanghai, but these are the features that are quite strong in these systems. So you could say that the policy borrowing from Ontario I've seen borrowed, you could say in Norway or in Denmark or other systems where what they're borrowing is the strategy, the strategic approach to a long-term vision that's clear, that is then uh, applied in the classroom with coaches at every school helping out um, teachers develop literacy and numeracy. So this I find quite positive, uh, only <coughs> when they are really adapted to the context. So policy borrowing, you cannot take one policy and just move it there. So for example, Denmark tried to borrow and they defined, they started off with a policy that was called the Nordic School and it was kind of, uh, it was not very clear what it was. And so then it slowly it evolved into the, the Danish folk scholar reform. And it ended up being a policy on literacy, numeracy, and also broadening the curriculum with more hours of study and more hours of play in the school. But um, using a little bit of the Ontario example, but they had a lot of teacher um, union reaction and they went on strike for a number of months because it had to change the labor relations with the teachers and the way that teachers Paid. So it has to be always adapted to context and to what is happening in the country and to the traditions and the history of how relations happen and how stakeholders exchange. So it can be positive when it's not fully borrowed, but it's transformed in a way that is meaningful for that country. Private schools around the world still rank the highest in PISA studies. How do you convince someone that equity is a good enough purpose to sacrifice this excellence of excellence? Um, there is no trade-off between equity and excellence. And when you look at the results of private schools in PISA, and you take away the impact of socioeconomic background on performance, they score the same. So it's rather that private schools take the people who have more monetary capacity or more um, well-educated parents and they go to the private schools. So, but when you take away, it's the same teachers actually and the same uh, curriculum often and the same education process. So when you look at the results of PISA in that light, they are not that different. So the, I think there is no, you can't convince me, <laughs> but uh, I think at the same time, what we want is good school systems, not good islands of schools. You want an equitable system where your society will evolve as a whole. And one of the ways to do that is having also private schools also take all kinds of students so that they reflect the society where they live and not an island of their society, so it's a broader issue for the whole education system and for all of us to evolve and to have a society that is, you know, where there is cohesion and not a very segregated society. Okay. Um, I'm following up on your response to her a little bit, but um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, either, either what you have seen countries doing or what they might be doing that they aren't uh, in terms of
evaluating the impact of policies. So you talked a little bit about the kind of data use that we're doing in the US, which is more, I think, on the level of are these students doing well, are these schools doing well, sort of there. But what I'm curious about is the connection, the, the sort of causal inferences about what was the effect of this policy? Did it do what we wanted it to do? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but um, I think the issue is when you set up a policy, what would be the best would be that these policies already include a component of evaluation from the beginning to look at the process of implementation already, you know, and to have intermediary stages to see whether this policy is working or whether you need to change it in the middle or whether you know it's doing what you want it to do or not and um, i would think say that this the irish example of the days the um, developing education opportunities was very positive it showed how this policy had managed to raise uh, completion rates of students and they would check every year, every other year, and it showed the change that it had on uh, student outcomes very clearly. And I think that uh, the more valuable data to show how the policy is working, the better support it's gonna have to continue and to mainstream the policy and keep it long standing. Well, I think we're about out of time, so let me suggest that we first thank our